What's going on? My name is DJ H. You can normally catch me on the One Extra Weekend Breakfast Show. And I've also got an online platform called Cut The Chat. Now, tonight, it's all about our second instalment of One Extra Talk, as it's Black and British season on the BBC. It's a season of programming celebrating the achievements of black people in the UK and exploring the rich culture and history of Black Britain. Now, we're going to be covering some very strong issues tonight that could contain some strong language. Evening, I'm Brigitte Tetter. I'm a BBC journalist and a presenter, and I've been making programmes about black British culture for many years. Now, last week, as part of the season, One Extra brought you the very first of these discussion shows. Uh, we took over the live lounge, actually, with a couple of invited guests. We had Shaka, we had Emma Dabbery, Ransom Bantz, uh, we had Jeanette Quachi, we had Joshua Verisami, and also Shawnee B as well, because we we're talking about his doc, Black is a Dirty Word. Now, you can still catch our live Last talk, by the way, on the One Extra YouTube channel, and uh, we discuss topics and issues that black British people face on a daily basis. Everything from stop and search, uh, racism at school, at university, but tonight is the big one, which goes back into the season as we discuss culture and identity. So we went across the country and we asked, what is it like to be black in the UK? It was hard for me to get my job, but as opportunities, things like that, it's a bit harder, I would say. Just any being any other race other than Caucasian. I lived in predominantly white area when I was younger, in Birmingham. They were quite racist towards us. They would like come into our garden and take the things off our line and rub them in the dirt. We were even scared to go to the corner shops. But then obviously we moved to predominantly black area and it's a completely different story. In London, the negative thing is the way I talk. So you're going to hear me talk with street slang and you're going to assume that I'm a, in a gang or I'm violent or I'm ignorant. You're not going to know I'm a 33-year-old woman who's qualified. I get more trouble trying to get into clubs and trying to yeah, get home yeah, on definitely. an evening than I do with my work colleagues in the armed forces, you know what I mean? Yeah, I do have to balance my culture. So I, I've got African heritage, but I also try to mix it. Everyone's wearing the afros like proud instead of wearing the weaves and trying to look like, trying not to look black. Where I feel like now everyone's embracing the blackness, which I love. I think there's like a lot more freedom. People have their own saying things, and I feel like that we've all come together more as a community to help each other out because my friends are white. Oh, yeah. I don't think I've ever been made to feel like I was different or any less than anyone else, do you see what I'm saying? So yeah, I'm, I'm quite happy being black here. It's one of the best non-African countries to be black in, if I'm honest, to be real with you. There you go. So we've heard from uh, some young black British people in the UK and the most important part of tonight is that we want to get involved, want you guys to get involved too. We want to hear your opinions and experiences, whether you agree or disagree, we want to hear from you. So you can text us on double eight triple one. You can tweet us at one extra. Make sure you use the hashtag one extra talk. And we're also live on the one extra Facebook page where our girl Whitney Henry will be across all of your comments. Yeah. So talk to us, but also talk to each other. And now like last week, uh, we want you guys to have an open forum. Yeah. We want you guys to talk about all the issues that are facing you and the culture and identity in the UK from the effect our culture has on the UK to the absence of black women in our magazines. So again we've got some special guests who will introduce to you in just a minute but not only that we've got not one not two not three not one, not two, but three, <laughs> three. live performances. So uh, let's start with the first. South London rapper Cadet is going to be with us. Uh, we got singer Barney Artist, and we've also got spoken word poet Vanessa Kasule. Make some noise, people. Yeah, man. And as you just heard, we've been joined as well by a live studio audience right here at the legendary BBC Radio Theatre. One more time, make some noise, people. <laughs> Yeah, man. By the way, that was even better. Uh, but first, let's introduce our special guest this evening. Uh, first of all, freelance journalist and the founding editor of the Black Ballad website. It's Toby Oradin. Evening. Hi, everyone. I love this lady so much. We also have comedian Judy Love. And DJ and musician Merkage Dave. Hello. That's right. 
We also have Gram artist Izzy Gibbs. Make some noise for him. We've got Shams Hayden from A Face for Music, Modern Agency. And we have Caprice Willow Turner, who is a social activist. Hello. So should we get to our first question of the night? And it's how has immigrant culture affected or enriched the UK? I mean, what are some of the positive things about immigrant culture and what are some of the negatives? That's right. Now, tonight, we are live on the radio on One Extra. We're on the website as well, but we're also on Facebook. So to get involved, all you need to do is text us, double eight triple one. You can tweet us at One Extra using a hashtag, One Extra Talk, and leave your comments on the Facebook live feed too, yeah? And those in the studio audience, uh, we're going to come into you guys as well. So put up your hands, you know what I mean? Stand up, say your name. Don't promote your mixtape or anything. Just <laughs> put your comment out there. It's all good. We're going to come to you guys as well. We need your opinions. <laughs> but should we start with someone's story about how and why their parents, or maybe even your grandparents, actually came to the UK? I know that my parents, they're from Ghana, which is in West Africa. Any Ghanaians? <laughs> ah, you see, I knew there were going to be a few in there. <laughs> and my mum actually came over to train as a nurse. So she was a teacher in Ghana, and then she came over uh, and the, to train as a nurse. And when she got here, the money that my grandparents had given her she realised wasn't enough. Mm. So she kind of um, realised that she had money to, to eat <laughs> once a day. That, that was all that she could do. And she went to the canteen and she looked in the canteen. She did not recognise a single item of food apart from the humble egg. <laughs> <laughs> so what she did is she ate a fried egg for almost a month once a day. Right at the end, though, there was a rather nice lady in the canteen who said to her, do you know what? We can make this into an omelette for you. <laughs> uh, but, you know, all seriousness, that was tough. One meal a day, just an egg. And there were, people, there were people actually who also said to her that, you know, don't touch me because of her, her skin tone. But I wonder for anyone on the panel, um, what was the first experiences then of, you know, your parents coming over? How about you, Caprice? Mm -hmm. Um, well, I grew up in an area, so it's just outside northeast London, um, borderline Essex. It's called Waltham Abbey. And my parents came to the UK, um, I'd say, I think it's like the mid 90s. And then when my mum fell pregnant with me, she moved to Waltham Abbey. Um, she said, Oh, I don't want her growing up in London, all the stereotypes that existed around London and the dangers and whatnot. And they were one of the first black families to move into this white area. And, I mean, they would get on the bus if they were short-changed. The bus driver would refuse them on. They'd get eggs thrown at the bus if they were on the bus. I mean, people would throw eggs at the house. They'd throw rocks at the bus as well. They were generally just, you know, shunned from the, the neighbourhood. But now, as time's gone on, there are a lot of black families living in this, in this small neighbourhood. And, you know, you've kind of seen the change in attitudes. Not everybody's happy with it. The older generations aren't happy with it. But these mindsets are dying out. And I think that, you know, things are improving. Mm. We're talking about what happened, you know, back in the back day. Then. And what about yeah. you, Merkish? What about your... Call me Dave. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Um, like, yeah, my... <laughs> Dave. Dave, you're right, Dave. Call me Dave. Dave. All right, all right, you're right, Dave. You're right, Dave. Tell, tell, me, right, Dave. tell me what you think. My parents are from the Caribbean. My, my mum's from Jamaica. <laughs> and my dad's from Solutia. <laughs> so, you, you, you know what that's about. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but um, yeah, I mean, for me, I think, I mean, they both came to, to the country when they were relatively young. I think, like, between about eight, maybe... I think my dad, my dad was eight, I think my mum was 13 or something like that. I think, for me, one of the things that, when, when I was speaking to my mum, that I learned, when, when you think about immigration, a lot of people, uh, especially this year, there's been so much talk around like the Brexit issue and around uh, even our US cousins like talking the, the Donald Trump, the election mm -hmm. over there. Um, and it kind of, when you say immigration, it almost kind of gets weighed with this kind of, it's like a it's like a stigma. Yeah, like a negative neutral kind of stigma. Mm. Yeah. And you could say, oh well, you know, they're bringing they're bringing this to the country and uh, they're bringing. Uh, okay. You, well, I, t I tell you yeah. what, we, we are definitely going to come on to that, sure. and we're definitely going to talk about the EU referendum. Mm. But I, I just first of all, just want to hear those stories of you know what happened to parents and grandparents. Is there anyone out here who can tell me why their parents came over to the UK? Who's got that story? Anyone here? 
Come on, don't be shy. What about you? Still, 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 still warming up. Judy, what about you? Why have yeah. your parents come over? Yeah, I'm Jamaican. Rock, rock, rock. Sorry, no, no, louder than that, yeah? Rock, rock, rock. <laughs> I got my papers, yeah? <laughs> my parents are Jamaican, yeah? And um, they came in the earliest ages, like maybe 1950s, uh, early 60s. And, um, you know, I felt I was kind of protected from certain things that they had gone through. So I remember, God rest my mom's soul, she told me a story of when she would go to the market with her brethren, who was a bit more coarse, yeah. And um, <laughs> she used to, simple things like buying potatoes, she was only offered the potatoes that was rotten. Oh, wow. You understand? So it's those kind of things. But I find the ones, the generations that unfortunately are dying off now, the eight-year-olds, the seven-year-olds, they actually held a lot of discrimination and oppression, and they faced racism every single day. But even today, having a conversation with someone, I found that the beauty of growing with such an older generation, they hid that from me. I never saw that. Um, as a child. The only thing I, I remember in the early 80s was um, doing up my mum's shoe and someone shouting out, that's it, nigger. But that was the first <laughs> time I'd ever heard anything like that. And I think that older generation kept it so tight um, and they kept it so withdrawn from us because their aim was to protect us. And another thing I want to say about that generation and what you were saying in regards to immigration, having that stigma and that negative uh, association. A lot of those people who came in that generation actually came here to work, um, to provide for family back home. They didn't come here for something. That's what... They didn't come... They were hard. If you ask any of your grandparents, great-grandparents, they had two, three jobs, and they had a sense of community that we don't have now, where they, I found out my mum came, then she sent for her sister, and her sister's husband, then they sent for the last sister, and they all lived in a three-storey house. So they didn't come here begging for anything. You asked us to come here, mm, and they worked. Trust me. <laughs> so, so, Judy, you were talking about the 50s there, weren't you? Talking about, you know, 50s, 60s, uh, when, a, when a lot of the wind rush, particularly yes. took in Caribbean generation, came over. And back then, uh, there were those signs that people know, might know about now, where there was no blacks, no dogs, mm. no Irish, that was posted on the accommodation adverts that mm. people used to see there. But I wonder how much then, since then, has it, has it changed? Mm. Do you think yeah. it's very different now, Judy? Um... I don't know. I think, I think there's such things as indirect racism. Mm. Yeah? Them days it was direct. It's, you know, same like in America. You kind of know what you're dealing with. Unfortunately here, you don't know because people are smiling in your face. Trust but they're already plotting to dismiss you. <laughs> yeah? So... <laughs> you know, so I think it is around, but I think that there's so much more opportunities. There's more opportunities for us. There's more opportunities for us to speak out about it. And I think that there's other cultures, other ethnicities that are also facing the same oppression that we face as, as a black society. Is it you agree? To, do you, have you experienced some of that as well? Well, well my parents, obviously my mum's Jamaican and then my father's Jamaican and half Italian. Mm -hmm. And um, like the time when he was born, he was... A, like the first to be like an interracial, like from an interracial like relationship. And like his, his mum, excuse me, his mum like abandoned him and his two brothers um, because obviously it wasn't the, the right thing to do at that time. Mm. So he must have had to go through some sort of like racial abuse. But my mum, when we sit down and we have conversations, she always tells me like, how when she was growing up, she used to have to go through so much like racial abuse. Even when she was like a little kid, like I'm saying of the age of like seven or eight, like in school, like she'd get called a gollywog and all these things. She laughs about it now, because obviously she's a big woman, but at the time she's saying like how like much it would upset her. And me thinking like as a kid, like I've got siblings and I look at my nine-year-old sister and I think, right, imagine if she was coming home and she told me that she has to go through that, do you know what I mean? And, I, and then I look at it and I think, right, so if kids are going to school and they're saying what, and what they want to say to like other children, like being racist and stuff, I just think like, what must their parents be like, do you know what I mean? Like, I think it's disgusting, really. I don't rate it at all. Sorry. 
Dave, you, you started to talk about, because uh, immigration, that is a hot topic at the moment. Yeah. Uh, why do you think that is? Why, I mean, why, why is it a hot topic? Um, I, I mean, I, I think uh, it's an easy, I think for, for the people that, that want to sell, the, the people that want to wield power, it's an easy sell um, to the population. Like, you know, you've got problems, look outside yourself. You should be looking up, but they're trying to make everybody look from left to right. I actually think that that, I mean, there's, there's racism, but I think even the deeper thing is the lie that's kind of sold to working class white people. They're told that they should look at us. They should be looking up. That's, that's, you know, that's what I think. Do you think actually that maybe people are scared of immigration? They're scared of different communities moving into the UK or being in the UK. Toby? Yeah, I do. I think that um, if you look at Brexit, they did a really good job of making that campaign emotional and playing on people's emotions and fears of the other, othering us, whether it be black or you be an immigrant from a European country, culture, sorry, and it caused a massive divide. And that did make people scared because it was kind of like, you know, they're coming to take your jobs, they're coming to take your housing. You can't get an appointment at the doctors because you're waiting for that immigrant that can't speak English and she's taking forever. So I do think the media have done a pretty good job of scaring our nation and causing cracks in our nation. Mm -hmm. And you can see what's happened. That's manifested in hate crimes and stuff like that. So, yeah, I do. And, I, and it's sad because there is this rising um, political movement of the right where they play on this idea of the other, the immigrant, who's spoiling this nation, who's filtering in and kind of like making it not pure, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So I do think that they have used that tactic. And I do think people... Sorry to say white working class people are scared of being, you know, replaced... So, yeah, I do think people are scared, yeah. Yo. Uh, has any of the audience got an opinion on immigration and, and whether you think people are scared of immigration in the UK? You guys are being real... Oh, there you go. Fake, wait one second. The mic's coming to you. You got to stand up, say your name, introduce yourself. No Hi, my name's problem. Fanta J. Hi, yeah. Ace. Hello. Um, I'm just going to say about immigration, I think it's really ironic about this whole fear of, are oh, they going to take our jobs or whatever? But when you get on the tube, what races and what people do you see cleaning the tubes? When you go to clubs, who do you see, see in the bathrooms? Who do you see builders outside in the streets and stuff? It's mainly immigrants. So I feel like it's ironic that there is a kind of scared vibe there when it comes to the working class, especially about their jobs being taken. But you weren't doing those jobs in the first place. Mm. So I think it's really ironic that that's the big problem and it doesn't really exist because you're not doing those jobs. You're at the job centre taking taxes that we're paying for. Is there anyone else in the audience who... Yeah, the lady there in the, uh, in the blue shirt. Just tell me your name. Hiya. Yeah, my name's Nissi. I go by Nissi T. Um, in terms of immigration, I 100% think that there's a kind of a fear with immigration, and that's because of education. Um, I'm a big, big, massive pioneer on education and, and people educating themselves in terms of your history and where we came from and why we came to the country. And one of the things you mentioned before was the idea that people didn't come here to, to, to steal what was what was apparently theirs. I personally think we came to reclaim what has already been taken from most of our countries. A lot of us... You know, a lot of us, um, you know, I come from, for example, the Democratic Republic of Congo, and people, you know, I can only speak for my history because that's what I know, but people came in, they took whatever resources until this day that is still happening. So, again, it's very ironic how people can then turn around and say, well, you're coming to steal this. Well, actually, you came to steal in the first place. You broke our economies. You broke our people. Therefore, we need to find a way to rebuild ourselves. So... So... Just to, yeah, I could go on forever about it, but I just think that people just need to educate themselves and understand that it's not about you're this other person and I'm this other person. Let's try and understand each other and understand each other's struggles and where we've come from to work together in order to move forward. Otherwise, we'll keep walking backwards. So, yeah. Nissi, thank you so much. So we're going to come to um, what you guys are saying uh, on Facebook. Don't forget you, get, you can actually leave your messages on Facebook live and you can tweet as well and text us too. That's right. Double eight triple one is the text number. Feel free to tweet us 
at One Extra and use the hashtag One Extra Talk. And again, we are live on Facebook, uh, on the Facebook fan page. Uh, we are streaming live on Facebook right now. You can leave your comments there as well. So we've been talking diversity and there are loads of areas across the UK where it is really diverse. I mean, back in 2013, Birmingham was dubbed an area of super diversity. Um, research revealed that it was home to 187 nationalities. Wow. And in 2011, research showed that more than a third of Londoners uh, were foreign born as well. Now, if you thought Birmingham had diversity. London is home to 270 different nationalities, wow. which is incredible. Um, why am I telling you all of this? Well, it's because we're talking about multiculturalism and about the fact that we all, or lots of places in the UK now, live in this kind of melting pot area. Do you think we're scared of living in that kind of multicultural situation, Shams? Um, I definitely think that a lot of people are scared of that. Um, people segregate into their own little areas like okay this is our nationality that's yours um, and I'm, I'm talking about the ethnic minorities um, specifically because you know as one we are a giant force but we don't we segregate and it's like no the, those are Indians there's the blacks over here and this is how this, the segregation takes place um, almost like we're scared of uniting ourselves um, you have people in the same way that working class white people look down on, you know, like it's black people's fault, it's the Indians that are taking our jobs, all of these refugees, they're coming and stealing from us. It's a lot easier to point the finger elsewhere and say, OK, you know, um, we're going to stick to our own because, they're, you know, the Indians have taken all the shops, we can't do that. The Somalians have taken all the internet cafes, can't do that. <laughs> it's like, we're not allowed to do nothing. And I, I think that that... Rather than kind of making it a big mould and, put, um, and saying, OK, everyone's going to work together. It's true, you lot know it. If you lot went to the internet cafe, you know you've seen that. Um, but I, th I think it's just about kind of understanding that, you know, at this, it's, it's, it's like everyone's just trying to be the best of a bad bunch. We're all at the bottom of the heap, sadly, and trying to work our way up. And rather than looking into ourselves and, like you said, looking up and saying, OK, what position is up there that I can have? Everyone's fighting for these, like, manual labour jobs. And, like, no one really wants that. No one wants to, to, to clean the, the train or to be the person who works. The people in my back shop by my house, what? they they work like 24 hour shifts for like three pounds an hour. Who wants to do that? I don't want to do that. So why am I beefing them? One thing I thought was interesting. <laughs> <laughs> One thing I thought was interesting though is that you were describing stereotypes there. You know, when you're talking about people doing different things or, you know, as you talked about, uh, people running internet shops or, you know, lots of Asian communities having the small shop. That is true, but there are other people in the community who do different things. Um, but the reason why I, I bring that up is because instead of doing the stereotype, should we be doing the celebration? Should we be celebrating multiculturalism in the UK? Definitely. I think that, you know, multiculturalism is something that's really big. Um, we all have different trades to bring. We all have massive resources. But these stereotypes exist, and those stereotypes are what usually these, these fears are tied to. They're tied to, OK, you're going to take my job rather than you're going to create... How many young black people in here probably started up their own enterprises or businesses? Uh, people are scared. I don't want your job. I want to create my own. But no one's looking at that. They're looking at the stereotypes, and that's what they're scared of. Uh, now, uh, this year, we celebrated the 50th anniversary of the Notting Hill Carnival in London. That was at Esther... Yeah, who's there? Anyone at Carnival? <laughs> Nah, and uh, we had like two, two million people attended and around 160,000 people at the Leeds Carnival as well. Now, I've been there. I was at Leeds this year. Uh, I've been at Notting Hill a few times, well, more than a few times. And it's not just black people there, as you know, you know what I mean? There's loads of people from loads of different backgrounds. Uh, it's, it's clearly loads of people want to get involved. That is multiculturalism, isn't it? Not in the UK. Um, people enjoying everyone's culture. Um, what do you guys think about carnival? That's, that's, that's a positive side of multiculturalism in the UK, no? I love carnival. Yeah. Out there, it's two, two skanks. Yeah. And that. yeah. <laughs> it's good. I, I like carnival. I think, regards to the multiculturalism, I think the issue is with that and probably with carnival, from, an issue, from my point of view, is that there's this fair. There's this fair. I think the fair comes from if, if you know your identity enough, your culture enough. You shouldn't really be that worried about integrating with anybody else because your stuff is strong enough. But the problem is within the black community, I have to specify the black community because I'm black, is that sometimes my identity is not strong enough. The things that we grew up with, you know, rice and peas were standard on a Sunday. I know nothing you like in the audience don't cook rice and peas on a Sunday. Let's keep it real. <laughs> 
So, you know, if it's, I suppose it comes with identity, it becomes with knowing oneself and oneself's culture. And when you're strong in that, you will not be scared to cross over. I suppose, and I don't mean cross over, leave yours behind, but embrace and enjoy all the others. Because the reality is we're having children that are mixed cultures, yeah? And I think when it comes to carnival, I think t some of the issues that uh, I saw or felt was that you're probably, the fear comes from it's going to be watered down. You know, it's going to be watered down. It's not going to be what it used to be. And then it's going to disintegrate. And then that part of blackness within um, Carnival is going to be missed and destroyed. And I've, that's my personal opinion. I think there's a fear of um, being watered down. All right, coming up next, uh, we are going to have a live performance right here in the Radio Theatre. We have got a performance from Barney Artist. Uh, make some noise for Barney. He's coming up real soon. And uh, after that, we'll be asking, do black or mixed race people feel as though they have to explain their identity? Uh, and don't forget, we like to hear from you guys as well. Keep them texts coming in, double eight, triple one. You can tweet us at one extra using the hashtag one extra talk and make sure you leave them comments on the Facebook live feed. Talk to us, talk to each other. Now, if you're watching this live on Facebook, uh, you've got our girl Whitney Henry. She's going to be going through some of your comments in the social hub. But right now, performing live in the radio theatre for us, it's all about bar the artist with his song painting one extra talks Yo, I feel scared, my brother, I feel scared My little sister's getting old and now she cares About the way she looks, looking at her hair And at the TV there's no dark girls there And I feel scared, my brother, I feel scared A culture embedded with lies and despair And passive racism is always in the air Tell us to get over something that's not even really there And I feel scared, my brother, I feel scared If I talk about race, they'll probably look at me weird Mention Mark Duggan's name, they'll get scared And now we got unlawfully shot, they'll probably be fair Why is that? And I feel scared, my brother, I feel scared My sister will get treated like an object Even worse, she won't have the guts to even object Cause she feels that being sexy is replicating a pet And that's a, and I feel scared, my brother, I feel scared That being a man has a different meaning Not walking away makes you seem defeated We're losing our kids over something that's fleeting yeah. And I feel scared, my brother, I feel scared that we don't know it's deeper than this And having money doesn't make you the... We don't want to be wealthy, we want to be rich and that's this, this life. life This life Yeah, yeah, life, life is, is a painting Life is a painting Life is a painting Life is a painting yeah. Red for the blood we shed. We shed, we took watch for tears, we cried. We cried, we brush you with tears of death. Yeah, yeah. We don't wanna open our eyes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. This life, this life, this life, life is a painting. This life is a painting. Yeah. Blood for the blood we shed. We shed. Took watch for tears, we cried. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yo. Brush you with tears of death. Listen, we don't wanna open yo, look, no, no, it's kind of funny how most of us get embarrassed, avoiding any topic that causes us to lose balance, focus on pleasing people with something we do, we can't live our lives unless it's constantly viewed, and now we're in the cycle where lives equate the likes on social media pages, your mind is in demise, got our kids up in stages, trying to find the right way to fit in society, hiding behind the light on that computer screen, or the iPhone, my mind's blown, by the cyclone, look And I don't wanna ever go back there Demand them in my ends, don't make you out of there Computer screens, or the iPhone My mind's blown, by the cyclone, yeah And I feel scared, my brother But I suppose that I'm here, my brother, my brother, my brother This life, this life, this life, this life is a pain This life is a pain, This life is a pain, this life is a pain, eh 
Red for the blood we shed. We said we took us for tears we cried. We cried, we brush away the fears of death. Of death, we don't, don't open our eyes. Uh, no, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This life, this life, this life, life is a pain. Life is a pain. Life is a pain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Red for the blood we shed. Being young, I used to be really scared of going up. Brush you at the fears of death. Break it down. But don't Yo. open eyes. Check. Oh, no. Thought process, I'm tired of I'm being honest. Tired of being honest. See, time ain't got no profit, man. Hammered Islamic, no bro, I ain't even on it. Felt terrorized by areas that I was once belonging. Longing for the confirmation from a generation that loved Obama Didn't even watch the inauguration, it's blatant Is it real? See brothers know the deal They won't pick up a book but a look will get us killed I'm shook on how I feel When I see a group of black guys rolling out night out the skies Myself in guilt, at the way, no never die Better get a cab in case they acknowledge you Remember you from them flats, look You left a minute Barney Focused on goals that would see them Barney Feel better than them and their dreams Barney Or oh, hardly but I suppose in my defense, I separated myself. We went to school, had it done a different C. Bessie, Bessie, Dancy, me, C. Lancy, my C. Man. The fact that I struggle with the mentality of the ends, but still look like him, I suppose it's easier to pretend that I never knew him. I never knew him, but knew him wasn't the easiest place to be affluent. Affluent was something that I need. I suppose in that certain sight, told me to leave this life. Yeah, 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 this life. Life is a painting. Life is a painting. This life is a painting. Pain. Pain. Red for the blood we shed. We shed. We took for tears. We cried. We cried. We brush you with the tears of death. Of death. Yeah, we, we don't, don't wanna open our eyes and our eyes and our. Yeah, 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 yeah. This life, this life, this life, this life, this life, life is a. Painting. This life is a painting. This life is a painting. This life is a painting. Pain. Pain. We said, of course, for tears we cry. We cry, brush away the fears of death. We don't want to open our eyes. Thank you very much. Awesome, awesome. Big up to Barney Eyes for that amazing performance. And a uh, massive shout out to Whitney Henry, who is still taking all of your Facebook comments. Keep the Facebook comments coming in. Keep lining up that Facebook page. Shout out to everybody hitting us up on the text and the Twitter as well. Don't forget you can text us double eight triple one. Make sure you use the hashtag one extra talk. Um, and you can text us. Yeah, I already said that. Sorry. All right. Quick shout out to Kweku on Twitter. Uh, Wednesday born. Big up to the Guardians. He says, big up to the Guardians. Uh, <laughs> He says, my parents came over to get a better life. My mum had to be interrogated by the airport security. Uh, big up to Iman on Facebook. This is the NHS would not have had the start it did without the nurses from the Caribbean. Yes. Uh, without, this, without that start, it would not have survived until now. Uh, big up to Di White on Twitter. He says, uh, this country is built on various waves of, of, of migrants and immigrants. Uh, and I really don't see what all the fuss is all about. And shout out to Harpy on Facebook that says, it saddens me that in 2016, we still have to live with racism and discrimination, <laughs> but preach we are a diverse nation. There you go. Keep them coming in, man. Text us, double H, triple one. Tweet us at one extra and keep lining up the Facebook with them comments. Thank you very much. So we've got lots more to talk about. And right now we're asking, do black or mixed race people feel as though you always have to explain your cultural identity? Uh, here it is, Ashley Banjo from the group Diversity, talking about his experience growing up in a mixed family. My mum and dad equally have been my biggest inspirations growing up. For different reasons, I feel that actually, as a mixed race family, in a way, the kind of culture clashes sometimes I think we might experience have actually made me, my brother and my sister stronger. Because my dad has got some really strong kind of African inbuilt traditions and my mum didn't quite understand and she has somehow softened him over the years and I feel that we've kind of got the benefit of both worlds so um, my mum and my dad both have been the biggest influences in my life by far. So that's uh, Ashley Banjo from Diversity there uh, talking about what it's like to grow up uh, someone from mixed race heritage. And in fact, we do know that mi the mixed race group is actually the fastest growing of all ethnic minorities uh, in the UK. But do you actually 
identify, if you are mixed race, with the black experience. And I'm looking at you, Caprice. Um, just, to, just to remind us of, of your yeah. own ethnic background. Well, um, both my parents are mixed race. Um, so both my grandfathers are white English. And they went over to Zimbabwe. I'm not sure when. But they went over to Zimbabwe. And they married and had children with both my grandmothers, who are both black Zimbabwean. And mm. both my parents grew up in Zimbabwe and came over to the UK. So they grew up in an African country and they came to this country um, with, you know, the African mindset and coming into the UK, an English, an English place where I think things are very different. And for me, growing up in that household, I feel as though, I mean, I eat traditional African food. I eat for Zimbabwe, if there's any Zimbabweans out there today. Well, yeah, yeah, you're there. I know you're there. <laughs> yeah, traditional African food, the music, South African house music, things like this. And it's had a huge influence on my culture. I mean, I've grown up with music my whole life. You know, waking up Sunday, Sunday morning to South African jazz or going to bed and my dad's, like, listening to his tunes by himself. And I feel these things have impacted me. I love dancing. I love music. I love acting. I love performing and all these kind of, the, that area of my life. But then my palate, you know, all the different flavors you, you taste. And, but then at the same time, being mixed race, it's like I'm, I've always been too black for the, as El Sweatshirt, if there's any old future fans, too black for the white kids and then too white for the black. It's always as if I have to say, you know, I am black and I do experience racism because my shade, my hue, is slightly darker than yours. But it still happens to me too. Just because my hair isn't, the curls aren't as tight, I still do experience racism. Everyone wants to touch my hair in secondary school. You know, I went to, I went to a secondary school in Hertfordshire. Mm. So I was f one of five out of 200 students that were black or mixed race. And that's insane, right? To think there's only five out of 200 students. And I feel as though as you get older, you start to pick up on the small things that, as I think you mentioned earlier, like racism, racism isn't always in your face. You know, the white boys would come up to me and go, yo, wagwanji. And I'm like, I'm not Jamaican. <laughs> like, <laughs> like if, you know, I don't actually know what that means. <laughs> like, let me, um, let, let me bring Shams in here yeah. on, on this question, because um, Shams, do you, do you ever feel like you're, you're forced to choose between, I guess, the black identity and the white identity? Um, I do feel like sometimes people expect me to choose, but no one can make me choose. Um, but obviously for me, on both sides of the coin, I have experienced racism um, and sometimes just a lot of discomfort. So I think that clear examples of, you know, when I was younger and I lived in Carshalton, and I was the... I was the only black child on the estate. Like, my mum is white, my dad is black, and he was estranged, and my brothers and sisters are white. So, you know, when they decided they was playing brown girl in the ring, they wanted to use me. I didn't understand why my mum was going ham. Like, she's raging everyone. She's going mad. I'm thinking, but I'm on stage. I don't understand. <laughs> like, I, I wanted to do this, but it was, I understand now that it was very racist, but I don't even think that they understood that they were being racist mm. because, you know, they were, they were kids, and this is just what they thought was right at the time. But now mm. it's like... We will beef. Um, but then also, I've also been in, you know, rooms. Um, I went to speak at an event. Um, and one of the ladies who, two or three of the ladies, actually, they said that they weren't going to speak at the event because I wasn't black enough. Ooh. So, yeah, they went on strike. I didn't care. I'm still getting paid. I'm here. But <laughs> <laughs> the fact of the matter no, is... Um, these divides, they do take place. And I'm obviously, sometimes when you're in a room and you're, you're a part of a discussion, for me, I'm, my black heritage is really important to me. But then when I'm in a room and it's like, okay, white people are horrible people and my mother's white, it also mm. kind of, it, there's a feeling somewhere that, that, that isn't quite right for me. Um, and it's like, am I out of place here also? I have, you know, obviously friends from all over the world, including people who are from mixed race heritage. And one of my friends is that actually she knows that she has both heritage within her, but she identifies more with her mother's side, who, who is white. Do you feel that you identify more with one than the other? Um, I would definitely say my black side because of the colour of my skin and because the, those are the nuances that I'm going to be judged by, like, mm. automatically. Um, I, I do, for some stuff, I always tell a story where... I'm not going to tell the story here. It's not... It's not, it's not. <laughs> Feel free. Yeah. It's not. Um, no, but I have some battles with myself. <laughs> I know Keith, who's in the audience, knows what I'm talking about. Um, but I've had some battles and... Sometimes I have a battle, I literally feel like my black side saying one thing and my white side saying the other. And I'm, I'm torn here because I'm thinking, well, I don't know, because I do feel my black side's a bit stronger in the tug of war. 
and sometimes that does get me in trouble. I can see some hands going up in the mm. audience. I want to get some of the audience in here. Is Esther around as well? I know Esther's got something to say about <laughs> this right in the front <laughs> there in the grey uh, shirt. And then we'll come to, to the lady in the mustard and that really nice necklace. Nice necklace, by nice, the way, uh, afterwards. Uh, Esther, what do you think about this? Um, hi, everyone. So... Um, my mum is white, English, and my dad is from Guinea, but he passed away when I was three and a half years old. Um, so my mum made it a really, really big deal to know my black side. So if we'd buy dolls, I'd have to get a black doll. If we went to buy books, it'd have to be a black empowering book. And I never really understood or appreciated it why you should do that. Um, I grew up in a very black area, and there was lots of mixed race girls there, but I think I was one of the only mixed race people who had a white mum. So I'd be called like the posh girl, the princess. And then I went to a very, very white school. I think there was maybe five, maybe three black people, two mixed race people. And I'd be called the ghetto girl. We'd have the slicks in our hair and they'd be like, oh, are you, are you wearing glue? Like, how are you doing your hair? <laughs> and I was... I felt very offended. I didn't know how to stick up for myself because even though I'd gone with my black best friend, I'd never really experienced anything like this before. But with, with all of that, Esther, do, do you identify more now with your black side, with your parents bringing you up in that kind of vein and going through those experiences? Um, yes. I'd say my mum knows so much black history. I feel like she's made such a big effort to make me understand my black history I think I engage a lot more with the black side than the white side. Was that right, though? Do you, do you think that um, she made the correct decision? I'd say, yeah, because I feel like if not, I wouldn't necessarily know my dad's history. Mm -hmm. And because he's not around, I don't actually have a lot of my dad's family around. So I think it's very, very good. I did promise this lady in the front in the mustard as well. Um, thank you, Esther. Yeah. Good evening, everyone. My name's Claire Tossey, and um, it's really interesting uh, talking about, um, you know, mixed race identity and stuff like that, um, because we can't really talk about being black and British without talking about shadism. So my mum's mixed race. My dad is the most beautiful complexion in the world and the purest coal complexion in the world. Um, but when I was growing up, my mum, who was mixed race, both born in Ghana, um, my mum overcompensated and she was very proudly Ghanaian, very proudly African. Um, my dad was like, you know what, you are British, you are English, you know, en enjoy the privileges of being English and British. But I have to really, really go back and think about the whole process when I think about being black and British and thinking, when I went to primary school, um, I was the African kid because I had um, a very unique hairstyle um, that was very African thread. Anyone know about that <laughs> hairstyle? Oh, boy. <laughs> anyway, let's not go there. So I knew I was African. I knew I was African when I left um, my house in year seven and I smelled of chicken in the morning because that was my pat lunch and stuff like that. Frying fish and stuff like that was my pat lunch. But then you get to... Um, I grew up in West London. Um, I went to school in Isleworth, Twickenham, predominantly white area. Um, I was uh, one of, you know, a handful of black children in the school, and we were black. We weren't um, Caribbean, we weren't African, we were just the black kids, and we all ganged together. You go to college, and all of a sudden, I'm light-skinned. Okay, that's a new, new race, a new entity to me. Oh, I'm a, I'm a light-skinned girl. And then I go to university, and you're not light-skinned, you're not mixed race. You're, you're, you're browning, you're browning. I'm like, okay, what is that? What does that mean? Do I have advantages? Am I, you know, what sets me aside from you? And then you, you go through life. And it wasn't until I had my own daughter, who, um, whose dad is, you know, her dad is mixed race, and I consider myself a black person, although my mum is mixed race, and my dad is black. And then the, the health visitor says to you, okay, so what's your child's ethnicity? And I go, oh, she's black. And she looks at her and she goes, no, nah, she's not black. What's your child's ethnicity? I'm like, well, she's black. No, your child is mixed race. And then you have to start to think about what exactly am I? So throughout your entire life until you've got here, if you're black, born in Britain, you've been told exactly what you are. You're not black, you're, you're light skin, you're mixed race. Actually, you know, you're African. Actually, mm. the Caribbean kids are telling you, you're not one of us. And then at one point, another point, you, you, you're grouped together. It, 
It's a very confusing experience. And I don't think if you're white, you, you grow up, you're white European, you're, you know, you're white Russian, but if you're black, you've, ha you've got so many other labels attached to being black and mm. British. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Can I just say that we, we are going to be moving on and talking about some of the issues that you raised, particularly with, um, you know, invert commas, shadism a bit later. So if you've got some of those, hold on to those. We'll come to them a bit later. And, and what if you're mixed African and West Indian parentage? My my mum's Ghanaian. Oh, is some of you in here? My mum's Ghanaian. Um, my dad's St. Lucian. So I'm like both sides of the fence. I'm very close to my St. Lucian side, but I <coughs> predominantly grew up with my Ghanaian side. So I always feel a little bit, little bit more Ghanaian. For those people that have both sides, do you, like, how, do you, how does that affect your identity? Merkid, could you chime in on that? I'm, I'm just West You're Indian. You're just West Indian? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, do you know what I'm <laughs> No, we spoke to you, and I, I know that you have a, an opinion on the... They're from different West Indian countries. Yeah, 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 for sure. Was there any... <laughs> Was there any kind of friction because of that, or...? No, do you know, do you know what? Um, actually, there w it wasn't too bad, because my, my, for a Jamaican, my mum's kind of calm still. Right. So, <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't too bad, but one of, one of the things I think that was bad that I didn't realise until I got a little bit older, obviously, like, there was a lot of things that the older generation showed us that, were, that was great, but one of the things that I kind of, like, resented a little bit now, like, I'm older, was put the putting down Africans. Wow. Yes. That was the thing, I, like, and it was like, when you're younger, you, I mean, it's like, it's getting put in your head. Mm -hmm. And it's only when you're older. I think it was when I read, I got like a book of speeches for my birthday one year. And uh, I read the, I think it's like Malcolm X's last speech. Mm -hmm. And he said, look, if you, if you hate Africans or if you're embarrassed to be African, you, you hate part of yourself. Mm -hmm. And that's what unlocked it for me and made me Realize. I, I don't think it's the same now, because like I mean, I, I can't. I'm only guessing, but like there's so many, so many prominent, influential people in youth culture that are African. I don't think I can't feel it doesn't feel the same. I mean, half the Grime MCs are African, right? So yeah. I don't think it's really an issue anymore. But it was it was a bit of a negative thing, I think, growing up. That that thing. There still is. There still is. I think a little. Yeah. There is a little bit of that. I think you know. I'm as you would quote and say paper wise full Jamaican British, but I have grown my children to say, well, I'm African uh, because I've traced back my history and I found out that I've got Ghanaian, Ashanti, Maroon in my blood. And, you know, I've had that. I've, I've got people, friends, family, whatever from past who would be like, I'm not African. And I think to myself, I look at them and I just think, I think it's ignorance to a certain extent. And I think a lot of us have to um, hold our hands up to it because, um, you know, we encourage that behaviour. Oh, my God, look at that girl's hair. Do you know what I mean? Like you're saying with the threading and da-da-da-da-da. Instead of we learn about our history, like the lady was saying about, then it would eradicate us continuing that ignorance and, and it starts from what we teach our kids and it comes back up. So, yeah, there is still a lot of people that don't classify themselves. Unfortunately, we have to tick boxes, isn't it? But if you know and search your history, you will know, as a black person, you're always going to go back to... Um, Dave said Africa, it was a little yeah. bit different, and you said you're doing something different with your children. So has it, has it changed? Do you think... I think... N no, I think by society, unfortunately, we're put into a box. The only example I can give is when my daughter was at school and she had, like, International Day, and they had to draw, you know, the, pick the country they're from, and she was like, oh, I'm, I'm African. And they were like... What, what? Um, yeah, but... <laughs> and she was, at the time, she was, like, 10, and she was like, I'm African. She was like, yeah, but your mum has that kind of, you know, that Usain Bolt accent kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> and they had to call me up and ask me, like, well, what's going on? And when I've explained, I'm saying, look, my daughter, she understands. She says, yes, my parents are Jamaican, but we've traced back our history, and at the end of the day, it, I can't pick two or three. You've told me to pick one. So I just want you to draw one big African map, and that's it. <laughs> Jeez. You saw some... Um... So there is still a little bit of... There's, there's some hands in the audience went up. Is anyone... Can we... we got this young, long lady there. Hi, I'm Ashanti. Hi, 
my name's April Louise. I'm Nijam, because I'm Nigerian and Jamaican. Ooh. And my sister. <laughs> um, we've always represented and known that we're from both. Um, but just for you talking about the tensions that come with that, like when my parents married, she, my mum was disowned from her family for 10 years. So I didn't meet um, my African side until I was like, we were like six. So there's a lot of tension with that. And also like, even though we're both, you can tell that we're treated a bit differently in each side, according to you, oh, you're half African or you're half Caribbean. Mm. And I feel like it still hasn't really changed that much. And what I think well, is... In what, of, in what way? When you say you're treat, treated differently, um, like what? Just you have those comments um, and then they look at you like, oh shit, you're half, sorry, you're half this or you're half that. So they, they know that they have to um, bite their tongue. So comments, comments like what? What are they oh. saying to you? I can't think of the top of my head. Um, it's been all my life. Um, I don't know. <laughs> I can't remember what's off my head, but all I know is that me and my sister have both been raised to do that. We're from both. We've always known. We have, we've always represented both, which is why I call myself Nijam, because I'm not just Nigerian and I'm not just Jamaican. I'm mm. both. And, yeah. So. All right. Thank you very much. <laughs> Anyone else in the audience got an experience like that? Uh, can we... Yeah, there you go. Someone's got the mic over there. The lady in the blue shirt. Hi, I'm Ebony. Um, I'm from the Caribbean. I'm Jamaican, Guyanese and Irish, so I'm mixed. Oh. Um, but where we say there was a divide between the Africans and the Caribbeans, I don't find that. Like, my mum is Jamaican and Irish. When she was 18, she changed her name to a Nigerian name. She's very Afrocentric, very in touch with Africa and its roots. But by saying there's a divide and that there's this conflict between us, I think we eradicate Caribbean culture, which we've learned to build up over the years. We're not the same as we were when we went to the Caribbean. We've got an amalgamation of so many different people mm. and we've grown our own culture that we should not have to sort of put to the back bench. We should be proud of this culture that we've developed. And this conflict between the Africans and the Caribbeans makes us almost ashamed to do that. And there's a stigma on us like, oh yeah, but you're African. We know we're African. We know originally we're African, but that doesn't disregard the fact that as Caribbean people, we've built our own culture and we should be proud of that. Mm. Awesome. So let's get one more comment up at the back. Um, hi, I'm Sebi Mavai. And going back to what you said about sort of explaining your blackness, I feel like in my life I've had to do that a lot in the way of things that I do say, I don't need meat, and suddenly it's, you're black and you don't need meat, like, you're not black. Or I do ballet and tap, and it's like, black people don't do ballet, mm. and stuff like that. I've had to deal with that my whole life, or exactly where you live and stuff. It's the stereotypes you're expected to, to stick to a certain thing. If you're black and if you're white, you do a certain thing. And, oh, the way I speak, oh, I speak white, because black people can't speak nicely. Like, mm. it's sort of, it's really, like, when I talk about it, it's really irritating, because it's sort of, we've sort of been, conditioned to think that we can't do things that other races can do and actually we're black and we can do what we want. Um, and yeah, <laughs> that's it. All right, shout out to everybody hitting us up on the text, double eight, triple one and tweeting us at one extra. Uh, got some messages on Facebook as well. Big up to Cara that says, uh, what happens when you're Bayesian, Irish, um, uh, English and Jamaican? My boys are all very different shades and people assume they have different dads. <laughs> well, uh, that's not bad. So you lot are assuming that as well. That's naughty. Uh, Zoe on Facebook says, as a mixed race person, it is very frustrating when being asked, are you more black or more white? Uh, this is a question which I have always faced. Uh, Lola on Facebook says, as a mixed race person, I have experienced racism from both sides. Uh, having said that, I grew up feeling that I had the best of both worlds. And uh, Charlie on Facebook says, I feel that I am immediately viewed as a black person just because I'm not white uh, and I have black in me when I'm being mixed race is a race in it. A being mixed race is a race in itself. There you go. Keep them coming in. Double eight triple one's a text number. You can tweet us at one extra. Use the hashtag one extra talks. And you can also leave a message on the one extra Facebook live feed. Yeah, talk to us. Talk to each other. Now, if you're watching this on uh, Facebook Live, don't forget, keep the comments coming in. Whitney Henry is going to be going through some of those uh, in the social hub. And just, just a second, uh, we're going to get to another very big performance from Cadet. He's going to be performing this track, Behind Bars. One Extra Talks. Oh. Hey, we want to be 
Actually, I turned Muslim when I was 15. Yeah, man, I knew what it means, but I didn't know Dean. I didn't turn for hype, but hype did bring Islam to the scene. Now I'm Muslim like most of my team. It wasn't my heart, but it was in my speech. I'm a young brother living in a dream. I can have a book in my bag or a knife in my jeans. Man, I was more into black history. You know, trying to find out about my fathers. And I can talk about that all day long. But I'm cadet. I ain't Swiss of a car, and most of my family is Christian. But it's not like any of them know the Bible. It's more like following suit. Like my nan, I told my mum do as I do. But I done as they never did. I was sick from the roads, and the book was my medicine. My nan, she had the maddest jokes that like, come and give nanny a hug, you little terrorist. Uh, but I saw banter. Uh, I didn't care about religion. But yeah, people take Muslim for hype. Fact to the matter, I was one of them. Cali in a bill. They took a brother that was savage in a field. Took a knife out and put a pen in and gave me a purpose, man. It's so real. You see, I went from saying, Assalamu alaikum, act for the sake of it. To Assalamu alaikum, wa rahmatullah. You want me to care too and keep fire lick. But I can't stop music, it means too much. The gram tempo, my heart beats too much. I know that the ish that I'm doing is haram. Come out my face, man, you pre too much. And you ain't gotta tell me I ain't on Dean. I know what comes with the music scene. And if I'm gonna go held and cool, there's no better reason than chasing a dream like, I don't wanna sound cliche. It's the first time I ever chased me a dream like, why would God help me? I was that same brother with a kitchen in his jeans, like I ain't trying to go to I just want to use the gifts that he gave me. But since you like having my stories, cool. Let me tell you the one that made me. I look, I must have been about six or seven. My mum should throw me a party. It was my birthday and I was gassed. And plus I was going to see my dad. See, I was a daddy's boy, well I wanted to be. You know, when he was around, it was my birthday. I'm excited. Even my cousin from East came down. Now, he said that he bought me a mega drive. I'm back then there with a lick. And yeah, I told my cousins you can play. That's cool, but allow me. I'm gonna go first on the ish. It said that I'd come around five. Right now, Mr. Van Eight. Everybody saying that he ain't gonna come. I told him, shut up, and that is just late. See, I remember running into my room, putting my face up against that window. Cause that window's at a mad angle. So I can see when he'd be on this road. Mum said, come away from that window. I was like, no, man, because he's gonna come. She said, at least come and blow out your candles. I was like, no, man, because he's gonna come. Yo, I fell asleep by that window. The side of my face went numb. Oh, yo, I missed my whole freaking birthday. Cause I was thinking that he gon' come. Now, I know that it might sound dumb, cause I moved on, but I still lived with a kid. Cause right now I'm 26, and the fact is, I ain't celebrated a birthday ever since. I grew up moving on murky with a kid, tried, but it would burn me ever since. And I ain't even where it gets peak, let me tell you. BBC just turned it up a bit, see me? I grew up in Clapham, and that's where I spent my teens. See, I was on Nelson's road. Across the road was Mac D's. Now when I linked up with my dad, he told me the truth. He told me he was on crack. He was in a dark space ill, but he's moved on. As a strong man, he ain't never going back. And that day he had my Mega Drive, but he sold it quick for that theme. And guess where this man sold it? It was across the road in Mac D's, it was Pete. Uh, but you know what? That ain't even what changed me. Even after the bull cap there, that ain't even what made me. Uh, a broken man, my dad be yeah he used to But that used to, we're so used to Now, let me tell you the man that I'm used to Excuse you, if you think it's been smooth you We just couldn't connect like it was Bluetooth He'd say a funny joke to make the room move I was trying not to crease like it was new shoes We'd go out to eat, sit in the new booth Wouldn't it be a happy meal, does not a fruit shoe Who knew that that man I was rude to Is now the compass, I say true to First put me in a box, that's Sudoku He'd get me out of the box like it was new loose Interview come, you took me for a new suit Forget then, I'm just glad I know the new you I refuse to, not appreciate it that you do Are you mad, my friends they talk about that, that ain't a thing But me, I'm lucky that man when he's a king See, he went from being a guy that I can shop to To being a guy that I compare God to Cause I'm happy when I see my dad That fast lane Johnson man when he boxed you Went from smoking rock to rocking the hardest suits My dad is the man I just wanna buy you a diamond watch, you know Put a different kind of rock in it And you know that, that you done for the kid is peak And I can't even put it in a speech When you even downloaded Twitter for me Just so you can retweet oh, That there gets me hype So who cares if I don't make it in the music Cause that man there, he made it in life. Yo, you look, thanks for listening, man. One extra talks. Yeah. Yeah. Trust me. We got to Cadet. One more time, make some noise for Cadet. And uh, big up to Whitney Henry, who was taking all your comments on Facebook Live. Now, if you just tuned in, you're listening to a very special wow. program uh, live in the BBC Radio Theatre this evening with your boy Ace and Brigitte Tetter. And we are live with the studio audience. Make some noise! Yeah. Yeah. So we've got lots more to come. We're here with you until 10 o'clock this evening talking about some of the big issues you've told us you want to talk about, culture and identity. It's all part of the BBC's Black and British season. And coming up, we're going to be talking about the representation of black women in the media. Asking, is the black woman simply not good enough? Ooh. 
All right, now remember, we want you guys to get involved, so keep your comments coming in. Text us, double eight, triple one. Tweet us at one extra using the hashtag one extra talk or leave a comment on the Facebook live feed on our page. Yeah, talk to us, talk to each other. So still with us this evening, we've got freelance journalist Toby Oridin. <laughs> Comedian Judy Love is with us. <laughs> DJ and musician Murkish Dave. Uh, we've got grammar artist Izzy Gibbs in the building. We have Caprice Willow-Turner, who's our social activist. And we have Shams, who's a modeling agency director. Yeah. So as we've mentioned, we asked you, the audience, what were the hot topics that you wanted to talk about? And one of the biggest responses was on black female representation. So, for example, there are currently no dark-skinned female solo artists in the top 40. And in fact, we rarely see them on our mainstream magazine covers as well. So uh, I want to move across to Toby here, because Toby, you set up a, something to give a voice to women like this. Tell us a bit more. So um, I'm a freelance journalist, and I set up Black Ballad because there's only one type of black woman that exists in mainstream media. And she's a woman that has white ancestry. And that, what I mean by that, or looks like she has visible white ancestry. She's got lighter skin or kind of slimmer European features, or she's got like a silky kind of weave down to her waist and curly hair that is looser than mine. And also, it's not just physical for me that's really disheartening. I think it's these kind of stereotypes of the angry black woman that is really, really terrible. And we had that, I don't watch X Factor, but um, I think Gifty went home and every single newspaper was like, she's sulky, she's got an attitude. I don't even know the girl. But then this week, my mum was watching it and I think a white girl went home and the entire country felt sorry for her. And it's kind of like when any black woman displays emotion in the media, she's automatically angry and it's problematic. And this is drip thread through all content. And that's the reason why Diane Abbott gets such a hard time in the media. Mm. It's the main reason. Like, there's no, there's, no, there's no reason why an MP, a white female MP, can tell her to shut the F up. And when she, and she doesn't say anything, and she's applauded, because what happens is the media put black women in this kind of lane of being angry, and it robs them of being vulnerable or being a victim, yeah. or it robs other races of feeling sorry for us when we go through these things. And that's why I started Black Ballad. And I think it's, I think to be honest, all media institutions need to do a better job of not just putting us in one lane in terms of our personalities, but physically there needs to be more variation because I definitely know that, like looking around the room, look at these beautiful black women, we're so varied and that needs to be shown, even on BBC personally, I think. Merkic, as an artist and a DJ, uh, why do you think there's so few black females in the music industry? I don't know, man. I mean, especially, I mean, dark skinned women are kind of the hype now, though. I kind of feel. What do you mean? This is the hype. Is the, like, they're, yeah. like, they're, like, they're in fashion, the hype, as in what? <laughs> Explain that. What do you mean? I mean, like, if I, if I, if I, if I, I put on parties, right? Yeah. And, um, it's like, there's, there's di people from all different ethnicities there. Right. But I'll say to the camera person, make sure you catch the black ticks. You know what I mean? Right. In, in, when you when you take the photos. So we, no, well that, that's just how I feel. Why, why but do you have to say, why do you have to say? Because that? I feel it needs to be put like a little bit no, but, like but like. You see what I'm saying? We shouldn't have to say make sure you catch the black chicks. It should be the cameraman catching the black chicks because they no, catch the No, but the thing is, the thing is, right, all we do, all we do is sit here and complain and complain and complain, right? But. We need to make the decisions. I'm someone who makes the decision. Yes, yes. The reason why black women get excluded is because the people making the decisions aren't even really thinking about it like that, right? Okay. It's, I'm making the decisions, so that, right? So that. I own my own stuff, and so I can tell the camera person what to do. So then that then goes And that's the what we need to do. We, we need to stop have... sitting here complaining okay. and start owning stuff. We need to own our own stuff. <laughs> Let, let, me, let me just give um, Caprice a, ch a chance to respond. I know you were yeah. trying to get Sorry. in there. Okay. Trying to, I know Dave's really passionate, but let's, let's just give everyone a chance to speak. 
<laughs> but that that does go that does go to the, as you said we need to own our own stuff. That's why I wanted to yeah I wanted to agree with you on that because it doesn't simply just go back to the say the fact that we need to own our own stuff. We don't own our own stuff for a reason because it goes back into history, right? I mean everything leads back to colonization, and the problem is Africa in itself is seen as pre-colonial, colonial, then post-colonial. And that's already given, like, uh, what's it called? That's given privilege to the colonists, and that's a big issue. We all think about it like that. And we don't see it for its magic, its spirituality, its nature, like the beautiful sunsets. Do you, do you know what I'm saying? And from this colonial mindset, it's been rooted into us from, from a long time back. Our parents, our grandparents, they've bred that into us. They've, without, without obviously meaning to, but, you know, it's something where we feel you know, maybe we're not going to get accepted into it because I've got slightly darker skin tone. I'm not sure if I should, you know, speak up and stand up. I mean, when I organised my march, I just organised it off the top of my head. And then I was like, wait a second, I've never been to a protest. Like, are these people going to take me seriously? Like, you know, like, I'm a 19-year-old girl. And you, we can't have those fears. Aside from the fact that other, the other things, that I'm a female and these all the, all the other negatives that are surrounding us, the fact that our skin colour plays a large part, we just have to ignore that part and step forward. And also... All right, Caprice, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry okay. I interrupted. I could see, I could okay. see you, you were going to go for it, but I want to yeah. bring in some more of the other panel here. And I'm looking at you, Shams, who yeah. runs your own model agency. And as we're talking about colour, about dark-skinned women, um, talk to us about that industry and, and your request that you get. Um, yeah, first and foremost, the agency in, its, in itself, setting up the agency, um, a lot of people told me not to. And then when I did, they said, no, you need to stop recruiting these girls, you need, you need lighter skin models, you need white girls, you need taller girls, you need skinnier girls, size zero, um, which wasn't for me because I think it's really important to understand that we work this in a similar way to you. Yeah. It's that you, you sit and you think, okay, do I want something that's already commercial or do I want to commercialise what I'm doing? Mm. And we do get a lot of requests for like mixed race girls, curly yeah. hair girls. It's the same old drill every day. But I think, like you said, it's, it's important to kind of, as a decision maker, say, okay, that's great, I'm going to send you what you want, but I'm also going to send you surplus. Um, here's some other girls who are actually amazing as well, but you might not have thought that you like dark-skinned girls because you've grown up thinking that you like light-skinned girls with, with light eyes or blue eyes and long curly hair, but you might not actually like that if you give yourself a chance. So but I think about, it is important to be able to do that. What about the idea that, depending on your skin tone, it depends what job you're offered? Did you, do you... Hmm get that yeah. in your industry? Um, yeah, definitely. Well, we have a supply and demand industry, so in terms of people's briefs, you know, they send their spec brief over, this is what I want, I want a tall... Usually so if they, it's the if same they, thing. If they want somebody who, for example, is tall and light-skinned, what kind of job are they offered and what kind of job is a dark-skinned model offered? Um, yeah, dark-skinned model is usually going to be... They do get offered catwalk work, um, um, and I think that that's also to, towards the fact that people want like androgynous people that they, they don't think are going to fit the norm of beauty. Yeah, yeah the norm. Um, and then things for beauty campaigns and stuff like that, they would, they'd want a, either a white girl, a Latina, or a mixed race girl, generally. Mm -hmm. So I think that in terms of, you know, and those, those ones are generally paid a lot more... Um, they're going to get a lot more, that's where they're going to get their billboard campaigns. So in terms of their, their visibility, it's like, okay, well, this is the ideal, this is beauty. And that's what's important. Because that, that Where's that coming from? Why is this happening? Um, I think that it's, what happens is there's a cycle and it's always reaffirmed by the fact that, okay, people say that they really love this ideal and then they keep being presented with this as the ideal of beauty and it goes round in a circle because that just reaffirms, I'm right, that is beautiful. And like you said, the reason why I questioned you when you said that black is cool now is because we are starting to see people, um, darker skinned ladies and people are celebrating them now. Um, and now it's making us think, actually, maybe I do think that a black woman is beautiful when we should maybe have thought that already, but we need that reinforcement. Exactly. Uh, I've seen loads of hands up. So can we go off. to the young lady <laughs> over here, please? Thank you. Yeah, yeah, there you go. So what's your name? Hello, I'm Mariette Immaculate. I have a hair brand called Catface Hair. I just wanted to touch on what you said about colonialism. I wrote a dissertation <coughs> on black feminism and it literally goes back to Africa and it looks at the black female she's taken from Africa. She has no body, no space, no language. And throughout history, we're, we're, always, we're always trying to reclaim that space and that language. Because when she's taken from Africa, she's raped to like breed more slaves her language is taken because they're separated so they can't create an uprising. Mm -hmm. So she has nothing. And yeah. throughout history, we're always constantly reclaiming what is ours. 
Yeah. And with my hair brand, what I wanted to do was create something for me and for girls like me. And now girls all over the world relate to it and they do like they feel that they can express themselves. And I think I feel like our generation, we're now creating for ourselves and we're doing it ourselves. Like we look at magazines, the girls don't look like me. They don't act like me. They don't okay. dress like me. So okay. I do me. And if you go on the internet, like girls like there's girls like me, and I've spot, spotted a few of you around here. We've all created stuff for ourselves. You, you know, so we just have to keep doing it. That's it. I just want to get some more questions in. Thank you so much, by the way. Thank you. Um, let's give the lady next to you and then this gentleman in the front in the, uh, in the khaki shirt. Hi, I'm Felicia. Um, I just wanted to kind of respond to what was being said about kind of dark skinned women being represented in the media. I'm black, completely black, but I'm light skinned. And I think that okay. I'm not mixed race. And I think that it's quite. Um, Frustrating to always be thought as, as um, you're always sexualized if you're light skinned. You're always, I'm not mixed race, so I don't identify with that, but I'm somehow put in that bracket. Beyonce does have Caucasian features. I don't think I necessarily do. I'm African and Caribbean. So I kind of think that, um, you know, the representation of black women in the media, I think it goes from really dark skinned, which is really, I'm happy that's being represented. And then mixed race women and it's like what about the light skinned girls in between that are black that I can't really relate to mixed race people in that way so I feel like that's always missed and also like you say like it you are treated differently like me and my sister are different skin tones and I'm lighter skinned and it's black people too that treat us differently like my family I'm treated differently I'm treated better at often at different points because I'm I'm fair skinned so it's something to think about I think black people do it as much as white people yeah. Yeah. so don't like so this gentleman in the front in the khaki shirt, what's your name? Yeah, hello, my name's Anthony. Um, basically, don't get me wrong, there's a lot of powerful black women in the media industry already as it is. But being a woman, whether you're white, mixed race or black, it's really difficult because a lot of women are seen as sexual objects in the industry. For, for example, you see them in music videos, they're dancing up and they're seen as sex objects, having the big bums, the big breasts. That's what, it, that's what a lot of body enhancements is used for. And then also, there is a lie for a lot of black women, being dark is ugly. Anything, any, if the darker you are, the more ugly you are. That's why a lot of women believe in the lie of bleaching their skin. Exactly. And it's done so much in the media industry that a lot of people that are trying to break through, okay, they want to be lighter. They want, them, they want to make sure they've got lighter complexion so they can go in the media industry and be more beautiful, change their hair, change their complexion completely and their whole body. But then we've got white people that want to have bigger lips. They want to have bigger boobs, they want to have bigger bums because they, they see that in the black people. So sometimes when you look at the media industry, it's not all about talent, it's also, it's also about how, the, how you look. Mm -hmm. And I think women will always have a harder fight of breaking through the media industry because it's a, a fierce competition. It's like doggy dog. Let me just um, bring Shams back in here. I know lots of your hands up. We're going to come to some, some more of your questions in a, in a second in the audience. And don't forget, they can keep texting and tweeting right. as well. Double H, triple one, tweet us at one extra. Use the hashtag one extra talk. What about this idea of body image? You know, the idea that now everyone wants to be curvy and so-called have a black body image. Um, I, see, I think in general, I think that having a curvy body image is something that's to be celebrated. I think that maybe putting plastic and, and damaging things in your body um, in order to change yourself and alter yourself for that positive image may be a problem um, because it is a way of damaging yourself. It's, it's almost like punching yourself in the face so you feel like you've moulded it enough. Um, but I, I think that each to their own. I did want to respond to your, um, your comment about um, yeah. black girls and, and their booties in music videos. And I think that I, a lot of my girls do music videos and I think it's a really important um, subject because there's always a torn divide here. There's a, there's a section where everybody complains and says, you know, including myself, and says, why do you keep choosing these white girls for your music videos when we have these clear beautiful women that you could that could represent us in something that is a media that is across outlets and a lot of people get to see and a lot of people look up to as an ideal and then you also have the other side where you said is you know and a lot of people have commented is that it is a sexualization mm -hmm. which is true a lot of the time but those roles in music videos don't always have to be there there are acting mm -hmm. roles and those roles sometimes steer onto other opportunities and if people are frowning upon people because of the type of work that they're doing it's an acting role and if they if that white girl was allowed that because a black girl has been shunned for that role 
now and you shouldn't be doing this because you're curvy and you're a black girl and that white girl then goes on to do, get an acting role, um, then we have a problem also. So we have to make sure that we're not shunning people for the type of roles that they are doing. But what's interesting about this is that actually when you think about black women's bodies, the perception is that all black women have a curvy body, they but they're also really, they're slim women. You know, they're, yeah. they're people who have <coughs> different body types. So let me just bring Toby in here because I know you've done a lot, of, a lot on this. I think the problem is, is that black womanhood is sold to aid the lifestyle of white women. And what I mean by that is that, and what I mean by that is that like, a few months ago, Look Magazine did this whole feature about boxer braids. And it was how, and it was, and it's, it's a sore subject because this is what I mean. It completely erases the black, um, how this relates to black women's culture. Yes. And it takes it and it sells it to white women. And that what happens is white women are in those offices. They get paid off the backs of black women. And I think that's a point that goes back to your point is that black womanhood is sold in the media and we don't necessarily address that. And to be honest, black culture is sold to yeah. white people on a whole. And that's Toby, what Toby, just one second, one second. Because yeah. there's two things you said there. One, we don't have anyone from Look Magazine here. Sorry. Two. <laughs> okay. Isn't it? Isn't okay. isn't that actually a good thing? Isn't it out there? No, because that no, that because sharing? I'll tell you why. If you if if you then say if there's a line in it that says this was a hairstyle for black women to maintain their hair, but there's a cultural erasure that happens in this selling process, yeah, yeah. and we're not credited important. and we're pushed out, and that's the big problem here. The cultural erasure. I'll ask you another question. You might not like it. I'm still going to ask you. Okay. But you know, what about the fact that it exposes? what black women are doing to their hair to a bigger audience. What no, about that idea? But the problem... OK, fine. That was, no. That, that was no. That, no. Wait, 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 wait. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on, hold on. But let, 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 let Toby finish and then I'm going to hear from you, all right. But how does it expose black women when they're erased from the pages? If black women are there, then it's exposed. And also, another thing is... So if it had an image of a black woman with boxer blade, would that be better for you? Yes. It would be better. It, and it would be better. And also, and that's, it would be better. But as I said, when I, I can fully pull up a tweet. When I see Look Magazine with Kim Kardashian and then there's a mention of Zendaya but, and Kylie, yeah, Kylie... There's no black women that look like me that look like half this audience there, point. and we're yeah, completely no, erased, and that is okay. problematic. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take, I'm gonna take your point. <laughs> Let's start to the audience. I, I realise there's lots of lots of really passionate and really valid views, and I want to thank. Sorry, I'll calm down. Sorry. I want to thank Toby. Sorry. <laughs> I want to yeah. thank Toby for her, her views, but I must say that Look Magazine are not here. Yeah, and yeah. I don't think it's fair, to, it's, not, it's not fair to actually say... Yeah, think so so yeah. just, let's I just leave this there and move on, because there's lots more to talk uh, about. Let's take, some quick, let's take some opinions from the audience. Let's take this young lady in the front, please. Uh, can I just say something? Judy. I would say, um, regards... I don't know if this is coming Sorry. Please, just regards know. to the issue of, you know, being a black, a black woman, dark-skinned woman, I think there's such thing as in internalised racism, and that's when, obviously, your, you know, your, your beauty, your culture has been broken down so much that you almost um, project racism to yourself, and you want to be, like, the ones that are projecting racism onto you and telling you that you're not beautiful. For me, as a, a black, black dark-skinned, big, fluffy, whatever you want to call me, <laughs> squeezing into the trousers, Black woman, I think I have to represent and own my own beauty. Because it might be another black woman, it might be another Asian, it might be another white lady, that doesn't find me attractive. But unless I am attracted to myself and own my beauty, um, you know, no one else is going to accept it. And I think, I think as well, especially within the black community, like you talked about bleaching, there is a lot of stigma. You know, I've got natural hair, you've got straight hair, you've got relaxed hair. There's almost that tug within the black community. Unless those things are eradicated, for some people that realise our hair might have to be plaited because it's winter, our hair will break. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? <laughs> and some of us... It's the, it's the truth. We need to embrace our natural hair. Like, yes, I've already been told, oh, when you do acting, you might, you might have to put your hair in weave or you might have to do... At the end of the day, if I put my hair in weave next week, it does not mean I'm not Judy Love and I don't understand my culture. Do you understand what I'm saying? But at the same time, 
to the media, if I tell you I'm going to take that role, but I'm going to have my natural hair, that's how it's going to be. Do you understand? Mm. So until we eradicate that internalised racism, until we advise our sisters to stop bleaching, yeah, and until us as black people ourselves, yes, we say other ethnicities, but until we st stop these crap, like these battles between dark skin, light skin, I want my baby to be this, I want my... Oh, he's got good hair, so I'm going to have a baby with him. And still we stop all of this. No one else can't respect us and embrace our beauty. I really want to bring in some of the guys as well here. Izzy, what do you think about this? I'm, I'm so scared right now. I feel like if I say anything, <laughs> yeah, then they're all going to rush me. Like. <laughs> nah, like, the only thing that like, I want to say is, obviously, I've got an older sister who's dark-skinned and I have a little sister who's, who's light-skinned, she's mixed race, and I feel like... Them having to go through life feeling like, for instance, like my dark skin sister feeling like she maybe like have to bleach or whatever to be accepted in certain areas in life, I think is upsetting. But then also I feel like it starts at home. Like I feel if most of these women that are involved in all these things, I felt if they had like a bit more support, because maybe they feel like, oh, because they're dark skin, maybe they can't go for this or go for that. I feel like if they were supported a, like a bit more, that they would be able to like strive on to. So then the question when they said about the top f uh, four or 50 or whatever in the charts, I feel like they'd feel more confident to do it, do you know what I mean? And I feel like that's a, that's a big thing, because I think it's good enough saying, oh, we see that this is happening, we see this is happening, but if we don't actually turn around and say, you know what, this needs to stop, it's gonna happen forever, do you know what I mean? So I do feel like that people need to support each other a bit more, do you know what I mean? Let's go back to the audience. She got a microphone, hello. Hi, um, I'm Jamal, and I'm a member of the Black Cultural um, Archives Youth Forum. Um, we talked about a lot of stuff, and basically, this is, this is like my topic. So, um, I'm Jamaican, and I grew up in Jamaica for a while, and I experienced a lot of colorism or shadism, whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to basically put it like this. At the age of 12, I permed my hair, because I didn't like my Afro hair. At 13, 14, I started bleaching my skin. Um, I started to put a clothespin on my nose, because I felt my nose was too big. Um, I looked up lip reduction surgery and I wrote down the name of the doctors that did it because I, I checked to make sure it was an actual thing because I didn't know if it was real. I wrote down the name of the doctors, their dress, all that kind of stuff. Um, I went and also I was, like, I was a Christian at the time and I used to pray to God to correct the mistake of making me black and making me a black girl. And it's all right, guys, I'm cool. I'm not <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> When I came back to London, um, I expected to come back to like a diverse place, you know, where everyone's different and we're all cool and that kind of stuff. But when I went to sixth form, it was a madness because like every single day, <laughs> someone had to say something about me being black or me being a black girl and something about my hair. But at the same time, they would also tell me that racism and sex and all these things weren't a problem. And it got to the point where at the end of year 13, um, um, one of my teachers came to me and she said that a girl in year seven, she's been bullied for um, the entire school year for being a dark skinned black girl and she has such low self esteem and she basically hates herself and she's been bullied all by black boys the entire school year. Yes. And yes. my school didn't know how to deal with it. They had to come to me because they knew what I went through and how I dealt with it. And I had to say to this little girl, like, you have to learn to love yourself. I can't force you to love yourself. You have to go on that journey by yourself and it's going to take a long time. And you might have bad days, but you know, you have to. And just to talk about this whole Kim Kardashian, Kylie Jenner, People like to call us angry black women when we don't like Kim Kardashian and all that kind of stuff. When I was in Jamaica, or even here, I got called, I got called I, people used to say I have a long lip, like a long mango skin peel. But when Kylie Jenner has big lips, all of a sudden she started this new trend. Like, it's, it's actually a madness. And just to say, you were talking about like, light-skinned women getting roles that, um, instead of dark-skinned women. Can I just say Nina, Nina Simone, the film? Yeah. Like, it's right there. When there was Angela can we, can we let's, take, let's take another question. I want to get into as many as... OK, the, thank you so much, by the way. Everyone, come up for this. So there's a lady here in the front. In, we, we're, we're running out of time, okay, so hi, keep it as quick as you can. Chair. Um, really good to be here, and thank you to the BBC for doing this. Um, I think what we've ex not ignored is the fact that we live in a society where women and black people are seen as lowest of the low. Yes. So if you've got both as yeah. I do, you're both yeah. black and yeah. you're female, you're literally lowest. at the lowest of the lowest of the low. Yeah. And I think, you know, the term that we refer to is that is misogynoir, yeah. you know? And mm -hmm. I think that for me, one of the things that really angers me is the fact that misogynoir not only exists outside of the black community, but it also exists within the yes. black community. And the biggest upholders of misogynoir are black men. I'm sorry, I have to say this. And I would like, I would like, I would like, I would, sorry, 
I, I would like, I would like the black men Not that we, we birth, we raise many times single-handedly, that we love, that we defend, that we march for when you guys are shot by the police, un yeah. unarmed. I would like you guys to reciprocate that stand a bit up more. For us. You know, I'd like for you guys to stand up for us more. I would like for you guys not to say, not to say that the reason why it is. I'd like you guys not to say that the reason why it is you date white girls is because all black girls have got a bad attitude. We wear weaves, we're this, we're that. You know, I think when we get, I think when we get more support and love from our men in the same way that we give the love and support to you guys, we will not have this situation. We will not be having these conversations anymore because we will not give a sh Sorry, Let, shall, we, shall we hear from we a man really, 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 really quickly? quickly. Let's, let's hear from a man next. Let's Run some bites. <laughs> Yo, that escalated real quick. Yeah. No, 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 no. Chill, chill, chill. But yeah, let, we got let, like 60 seconds. Let's slide away from that. You know what you were saying about our culture, X, Y, Z? Most of the time, think about it. Go to nightclubs, they play our music, won't let us in. It's the same thing all around. They package our culture, sell it, and we're not making no money from it. So that's how, what it boils down to at the end of the day. We've got to have some kind of ownership over our stuff. Yes. Or if we're not making money, don't turn up. Yeah. Simple. Simple. And I think James is right. It's about finding your niche, finding your gift, uh, fulfilling your purpose, and trying to own your own and sell within your own community and outside of the community. Having ownership of what we have is exactly what Dave said, and I agree we with that. We could keep talking, but we're almost out of time. Yes. Thank Sorry, you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Oh, man. Uh, just quickly. Right. Great one, show. One sentence. Race is a social construction that was made by the white man many, many years ago. And we have to remember that because we're using it against each other. Pardon? Right. We got to go. We got to... All right, now that's nearly it. That's nearly our time for today. Now, please check out the rest of the Black and British season across the BBC. Um, make sure you stay on Facebook. Keep the conversation going. Uh, next up on One Extra, Sam Anderson is going to take over. Keep the conversation going. But right now, uh, we are going to go to a performance from Vanessa Kisule. Uh, she's wrote a special piece for this evening. So let's get to that. Vanessa Kisule. Hi, everyone. Wow. <laughs> that was a lot. Um, thank you so much for having me. Um, I wrote a piece based on the question, are black women simply not good enough? And, you know, I knew what was meant to be discussed around that, the very worthwhile topics that then got addressed just now. But the, the, the wording of that question just snagged me in all my chakras, man. I just, I can't, I can't, I, I'm, I'm done pitching often to the establishment, often to white people, as to whether we're good enough or not, because actually this fallacy of black excellence, I mean, don't get me wrong, we, we've been excellent, we are excellent, we'll continue to be excellent, but let me be average if I wanna be. I don't have to be like over and above to have a rightful place on this, on this good green earth. So um, this is a response to the question, are black women simply not good enough? And um, it's called busy. We weren't there when the big debate happened on our worth, our beauty, our humanhood, we declined the invite to come to the scorched patch of earth you offer us from which to scrabble for vague glints of any dignity and pride we can find in the dust. We were busy, soaking beans in a large pot for a late dinner, looking through photos of old friends floating on clouds of nostalgia. We were arguing with our hairdresser on the phone, it pressed between shoulder and cheek, massaging coconut oil into our scalps as we surveyed the morning paper. We were feeling the spine of a book crack as we sit on the bus. This one's a good one, one recommended by a friend. We're far too engrossed to look up from the page. We were otherwise engaged, being in love, being bored and glorious, average and exceptional, more pressing matters called us our morning prayers and young children. We were running to a doctor's appointment, passing a local boots where Lupita Nyong'o graces the window with a smile like a private joke only we are in on. We are fashionable these days, fleetingly, as we have been in the early 90s when Alec Weck's oil spill skin gave the catwalks a cursory smudge of the edgy ethnic, but we will be out of favor again. 
briefly embraced then discarded, that is just fine. We have a lot on our plate. We are planning marches in Caribbean cafes with stiff doors and soft chairs. We're making love on rainy Sunday afternoons, rubbing our sore heels and panning for gold inside ourselves. We are laughing and slapping our thighs, our church organ lungs swelling in song. We are singing in a shade of pain and joy that shaped a whole culture with all that noise. We didn't hear the door knock or the phone ring. We're sorry we did not get your message in which you so kindly consider inviting us in. We were busy building a table on which to nourish the growl inside us. Our bellies are full now. We'll get back to you at our earliest convenience. Or maybe we won't. It's just that we're very, very busy, you see. <laughs> 